All right, well, let's open up to Joshua 24. We're going to finish uh, this book this morning. As uh, Joshua is going to release Israel and send them out into their different territories. And as I was reading, reading this chapter, it kind of reminds me of when a parent would send their child off to, to college or their adult child off to college. Um, and, um, you know, normally when a, when a parent does that or when parents do that, they give them some kind of talk, some kind of advice uh, before they send them off to college if they're going um, out of state. And, um, and I was trying to think about if, if we had one thing, one piece of advice, right, that we could give um, if you were a parent and you're sending a kid off to college, if you had one advice, what would that advice be? If you could only choose one thing to give to that adult child, what would that piece of wisdom be? Maybe it's the advice of just sticking to the studies, right? Be careful about hanging out with the wrong people because they might take you away from your studies. Maybe it's warning them to stay away from partying. Maybe uh, it is encouraging them that, hey, if it doesn't work out, you can always come back home and, uh, and, and, and stay with us. Or maybe it's the opposite. Reminding them how much tuition costs, and they better not come back home, right? They better, they better finish that, that, um, that degree that they're working towards. What would be that one thing before sending off that, that, uh, that child? Well, Joshua, he's sending out the Israelites into their land to enjoy and to serve the Lord in their new territory. And before he leaves, before he sends them out, Joshua gives them a message and interestingly, what he focuses on is the faithfulness of God, which has been a major theme throughout this entire book. That's why our series it has been called Faithfulness, because it's a major theme in Joshua that, that comes up and gets repeated over and over, that not one single promise that God has made has failed to come to pass, because he is faithful. He promised Abraham and his descendants the land, and Joshua is all about the fulfillment of those promises of um, the Israelites entering into the land. And as they do that, they need to remember the faithfulness of God because it's so important. Because when we go through difficult times in life, when circumstances are just really rough, what we need to remember that God is faithful so that we can trust Him in that hard circumstance that we are in. When we're experiencing dry seasons where we're going nowhere in the workplace, we feel like our lives have not progressed, maybe our relationship with God feels dry, in those moments we need to remember that God is faithful, that He has not left us, that He is for us and He is not against us. We need to remember the faithfulness of God when we're in fruitful seasons of life, right? When everything seems to be going well, everything we're praying for is being answered, right? relationships have been going great, work has been just super productive. In those moments, it's easy to forget the Lord, to rely on ourselves, and to celebrate ourselves. That's when we need to remember that it's because of the faithfulness of God that we're experiencing the fruitfulness of God, and it keeps us humble. And so God reminds Israel about his faithfulness in this chapter, and he does that through Joshua. It's like Joshua's going to pull out his phone, open up his, um, his photo app, and just kind of scroll through different pictures of Israel's history and how God has been faithful to them over and over again. And so we're going to look at these different pictures that were given and, and, and to see God's faithfulness. So let's look at Joshua 24, starting with verse 1. As he says, Joshua said to all the people, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and worshipped other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the region beyond the Euphrates River, led him throughout the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I gave the hill country of Seir to Esau as a possession. Here's the first thing that, that uh, we see with God's faithfulness is that it is based on God's grace. God's faithfulness to his people is based upon God's grace, not based upon the people's faithfulness. Right, when we think about Abraham, 
I think what comes to mind when a lot of people think about Abraham is his faith in God, right? That he was willing to leave the land he was living in in order to go out into a new territory trusting God. Or when we think about Abraham, we think about he, how he faithfully uh, was willing to sacrifice his son Isaac because God told him to. But what we don't hear too much, I think, about Abraham is his life before God called him. Right? It's easy to assume that God called Abraham because Abraham was such uh, a moral guy that he deserved to be chosen, that he was different from everybody else that he was living with. But that's not the case. Here's what Joshua reminds us, is that Abraham worshipped other gods. Abraham was an idol worshiper just like everybody else. His family was idol worshippers. He didn't do anything that would stick out, that would have God choose him. And what that means is that God chose Abraham based upon God's grace, not Abraham's potential. God multiplied his descendants, gave him the son Isaac and Jacob and Esau because of his grace. And God deals with us the same way when it comes to his faithfulness. It's based upon his undeserved favor. Right, think about it. If we came to, right, we trusted in Jesus as our Savior and as our King, it wasn't because we were smarter than somebody else, that we put the pieces together when it comes to the gospel. It wasn't because we were more ethical. It wasn't because we had some sort of talent that God would look at us and say, oh, you got potential. I'm going to choose you because you can do a lot for me. No, all of it, right, is based upon God's grace. That's why he chose us just like Abraham. And that should lead us to gratitude, to worship, that God chose us out of his grace. His faithfulness is because of his unmerited favor. You know, the second thing is faithfulness, it's by God's rescue. We see God, his faithfulness by God rescuing his people. Let's look at verse 5. I sent Moses and Aaron, and I defeated Egypt by what I did within it. And afterwards, I brought you out. As we read through these verses, I want to highlight the word I, right? We're going to see that a lot in these verses. Look at verse 6. When I brought your ancestors out of Egypt, and you reached the Red Sea, the Egyptians pursued your ancestors with chariots and horsemen as far as the sea. Your ancestors cried out to the Lord, so he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea over them, engulfing them. Your eyes, own eyes saw what I did to Egypt and that you lived in the wilderness a long time. Right, God shows his faithfulness through God rescuing his people. God rescued his people out of Egypt. God split the Red Sea so that they could miraculously walk through it. And while the Egyptian army tried to walk through it, what happened was they drowned. Right, God rescued them. And this historical rescue right, foreshadows the greater rescue of God that he accomplished through Christ. Through his death on the cross, Jesus split the sea of death so that he could, we could pass through it and enter into the presence of God forever. But we also see God's faithfulness in our everyday things of life, where he delivers us from difficult circumstances. Sometimes it looks like God giving us the strength to persevere through that hard relationship, persevere through that hard work situation, or God completely removes us from some circumstances. But God is our great del rescuer who delivers us and protects us. We're going to see that protection in verse 8. He says, Later I brought you to the Lord, land of the Amorites, and you live beyond the Jordan. They fought against you. But I handed them over to you. You possessed their land, and I annihilated them before you. Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, set out to fight against Israel. He sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam. Instead, he repeatedly blessed you, and I rescued you from him. We see God's faithfulness through his protection of his people against his enemies. See, in this case, um, Balak was a king, and he didn't want Israel to, to, to be, with, be in the land, and he, he hated them. And so he hired out a false prophet named Balaam. And what Balaam did was he was supposed to speak a curse, speak bad things over Israel. And when Balaam opened his mouth to try to curse 
Israel, try to speak bad things. Instead, God, God made Balaam speak blessings on Israel. God controlled the mouth of a false prophet in order to bless his people. What that shows us here is that God is faithful to protect us. <coughs> He's faithful to protect his people. This doesn't mean we won't uh, experience suffering. It doesn't mean we won't have illness or even physical disabilities. Right? That's the result. We live in a broken world that's waiting to be redeemed. Our bodies are broken. But what it does mean when God is our protector is that he will protect our relationship with him. He protects our future life with him. Our position as his children are, is safe. No one can snatch us out of the hand of Jesus. He holds us until he brings us home. That's the protection that he gives us. It's secure life in him. But not only does he do that, but God gives victory then for his people. It's another way that we see the faithfulness of God in our lives. is giving victory to God's people. Let's look at verse 11. He says, You then crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. Jericho's citizens, as well as the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites fought against you. But I handed them over to you. I sent hornets ahead of you, and they drove out two Amorite kings before you. It was not by your sword or bow. So God right, lists all these different groups that Israel defeated. But he wants to make it clear, it wasn't because of Israel's military technology. It wasn't because of their, um, them being a powerhouse. It was because the Lord fought for them. The Lord handed over the enemies to Israel. And God wanted to make it very clear that it wasn't the size or skill of their army, but the Lord himself. And it says here, he even used hornets. Right? God even used biology in order to defeat his enemies. He gives victory for his people. God gives victory for us in our lives over sin, over Satan, over death by the power of Jesus. He gives us victory when dealing with temptations that we face, sin in our lives. And that's important because I think when it comes to dealing with temptation and, and sin in our lives, uh, we can put a lot of emphasis on strategies, on how to flee from sin or, or flee from temptation and overcome sin. Right, we can ask other people to hold us accountable. Uh, we can try to come up with strategies over how we can honor God in our work, in our personal lives, in our finances, and not fall into temptation. And those things could be really wise and, and good to have, right? It, it's wise to have strategy. It's wise to have counsel. It's wise to enlist accountability in our lives to help us. But you can have all those things and yet fall into temptation. Because the ultimate one who gives us victory over sin in our lives is God. The Holy Spirit living in us, giving us the heart to, to hate sin and to want to flee temptation in our lives. And it's not because it's our religious duty or for the religious sake that we do it. It's not to impress people that we fight sin and flee from temptation, but it's because we genuinely love the Lord and want to honor Him because He loved us. We value what God values. We hate sins because God hates sin. Right? It's about following the Lord, not following a type of religious system. That's what it looks like in fighting sin in our lives, that God gives us victory over. Lastly, we see the faithfulness of God. And our response, we'll see, is that He's faithful through His provision. He provides for us abundantly. Look at verse 13. I gave you a land you did not labor for and cities you did not build, though, uh, though you live in them. You are eating from your vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Right, so God says, is saying here, he provided the land that he promised, cities to live in, vineyards, olive groves, things to enjoy. God here, he is the great provider who gives us everything that we need. It's God's provision 
that's seen throughout this entire chapter, right? As over and over, we see God emphasizing himself, I. In verse 3, God says, I took and led you. In verse 5, he says, I sent Moses and Aaron. I brought your ancestors. Right? In these verses, God's saying, I provided. I'm the giver. His people are the receivers. God is the provider in our lives. Right? The job that we have, that maybe we think we've earned and worked for, He ultimately gave it to us. Or the money that we earn, He ultimately provided these things. The talents and abilities that enabled us to work, that enabled us to have the, the pay scale that we have, God gave us those skills, those abilities, those relationships, the educational background, all these different things He gave us so that we would enjoy the blessings that He gives us. And it's easy to forget, to forget that it is the Lord who does these things for us. So how do we respond, right? As Israel is, is, is shown all the ways that, that he, God has blessed them, how do we respond then to this faithfulness? I want to encourage us two ways, two ways that we as his people can respond to how just good and faithful God has been in our lives. The first is this, is that we're called to fear the Lord. We're called to fear the Lord. Look at verse 14. Here's Israel's response. Supposed to be. He says, Therefore, fear the Lord and worship him in sincerity and truth. Right? It sounds a lot like John 4, right? worshiping God in spirit and in truth. In the fear of the Lord. Right? We can have uh, a wrong view of the fear of God. It's easy to, to have a wrong view. Right? Some people take the view of the fear of God to be one of terror, the, one, the, the, the way you would view um, a tyrant of a country or an abusive parent, one who is just wild and emotionally unhinged, who just flies off the handle all the time and is unpredictable. They're vicious. They're self-centered, right? Their, their anger is self-centered. But this is not the fear of the Lord. It's based out of God's holiness, not upon just rage and and um, um, tyranny. But others can view um, the fear of the Lord in, in a different way. They can see it like a massive wave or a towering mountain that is powerful and beautiful to see. Right? When you go out and see large waves, right, it, it, it can be intimidating. Other times when I fly in a plane and I'm looking down at the Pacific Ocean, just seeing how vast the Pacific Ocean is and how deep it is, it, it's, it kind of gives a se sense of respect and, 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 and fear, just knowing how ferocious the waves can be. And it can kind of you know, give us an idea of the fear of the Lord as far as its awe and power, power but it, it doesn't fully give us a picture of the fear of God. Because a massive mountain towering waves, the deep ocean, it's impersonal. We don't receive love from a towering wave. Right? We get wiped out from a towering wave. But with the Lord, wait, we receive relationship with Him. The fear of the Lord, it's a godly fear that sees the holiness of God, that recognizes our sinfulness in light of His holiness, that acknowledges that we are deserving of God's judgment, just as we've been reading about in the book of Joshua, that we deserve death. And yet, in God's mercy, He rescued us. The fear of the Lord recognizes that God hates sin because He is holy and good, and that He must judge all wickedness, and that we fall into that category. But here's the thing, right? The fear of the Lord doesn't drive us away from Him, but the fear of the Lord should drive us to him. Because to run away from God is, is death, because God is life. But to run to the Lord is life and adoption, faithful love. We grow in the fear of the Lord as he opens our eyes up to how holy he is and how sinful we are and how much in need we are of him, that we would run to him and find security. Like a child, like the child of the greatest martial artist in the world, right? Those who aren't his kids are afraid of him because he's the greatest martial artist. But his child can jump into his lap because that's his child. God wants us to experience that kind of intimacy, 
that we can run into the lap, into his lap, even though, right, he's totally powerful. He's a God of judgment. He's worthy of our fear, a fear that drives us to him and has us stand in awe of him and experience his closeness, the fear of the Lord, experiencing his love. A second way we respond to the faithfulness of God, it's to treasure him, to treasure him above all things in our lives. Let's look at the second part of verse 14. Joshua says, right, fear the Lord, worship in sincerity and truth, get rid of the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and worship the Lord. So this was still a temptation for the Israelites because they came out of a land that had idol worship as well as they were entering into a land that had idol worship. An idol is anything that we treasure more than the Lord, anything that we're more devoted to, anything or anyone that we value more, that influences us more. They could be relationships. They could be stuff. They could be ourselves, our dreams, our goals, our jobs. This is what drives us, what causes us to drop everything in our lives. Right? God is to be his people's greatest influence, his people's greatest gift, his people's greatest relationship and treasure. And a lot of times, right, so for the Israelites, right, the idols in their lives were false gods. But oftentimes, as followers of Jesus, right, idols in our lives could be very good gifts from God. It could be family and relationships and good, good gifts that God has given us that, that, that God doesn't want us to throw out of our lives, but rather to see them correctly as beautiful gifts from God, that, that we can worship the Lord as we experience these gifts. The Israelites, God's people, they were to treasure God above all things. They were to get rid of their idols. God was to take the seat of the most valuable person in their lives. Right, so for us, like, what is the most valuable thing that's sitting on the seat of our hearts? Right, that would be is whatever we worship, whatever sits on our hearts. So how do we, and that could be a good thing, right, a good gift, a good relationship, but how, how do we experience God, in a sense, sitting on that seat instead? dethroning whatever it is on our hearts. Well, author Thomas Chalmers, he describes this, this uh, removal as an explosive power of a new affection. An explosive power of a new affection. And in his book, what he describes is how when we experience a superior affection and delight in something, it'll expel the idol in your life. So if we're worshiping something, right, and we're like, okay, I gotta, I gotta get that out of the seat of my heart. I gotta get it out. What, what Chalmers is saying is the way you do that is by introducing a superior desire and affection that dethrones that thing that's, or that that idol that's sitting on our heart. In other words, when we, when we see the Lord, when we experience his love and his goodness and his joy and his satisfaction in our lives, that frees us to then let go of whatever it is that's captured our hearts because the Lord is that explosive power. It's that new affection in our lives. And I think we see that in the parable of of, of the hidden treasure in Matthew 13, 44, where it says a man found the kingdom of God and in his great joy, he goes and he sells all that he has and he buys that field. All right, so this man s finds a treasure in the field. In his joy, he buries it and he sells what he has and he buys that field because he found the treasure. In other words, here's what happened is this man had stuff in his life. But when he found this treasure in the field, that superior desire caused him, and it says, in his joy, sell what he had in order to purchase that field. It's that explosive power of a superior affection. Right? When we experience the Lord, the love of God in our lives, where that expels the idols, in our lives. We're willing to let go of things that we've been clutching a hold of. 
when we experience God, it's not religion, it's not rules, but God himself, we're captured by his love. See, here's the thing, right? We can put, when it comes to, like, temptation in our lives, when it comes to idols in our lives, we can put a lot of different rules on not falling into temptation. We can ask accountability partners, hey, could you hold me accountable to this? Uh, but, and, and again, those are good things, and, and we should, it's good to enlist support. We, we got, the Lord uses that. But, right, if our ultimate desire is for that thing, we're going to find ways around it. We're going to work our way around that internet filter to get what we want. We're going to lie to our accountability partner, or we're going to flat out avoid them. Right? When, when you have a superior, when you have some sort of desire that you want, you'll find a way to get it, right, eventually, eventually. But when we have a superior affection, a superior delight that's only found in Jesus, then that, that dethrones that idol that we're treasuring so much. See, the people of God, they were to be devoted to the Lord in the land, to enjoy the Lord. And as a result, they're to get rid of the idols in their lives. One last response. Sorry, there's three. As they enjoy the Lord, they're to depend on the Lord. They're to depend on His faithfulness. Joshua tells the people, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then he calls the people in verse 16 to serve the Lord. And the people say, we will certainly not abandon the Lord to worship other gods. Right, so they make this declaration, all right, we're going to be faithful to God. We're going to serve him, just like you, Joshua. But look at verse 19. Here's what Joshua says. But Joshua told the people, you'll not be able to worship the Lord because he's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions and sins. If you abandon the Lord and worship foreign gods, he will turn against you, harm you, and completely destroy you after he has, done, has been good to you. No, the people answered Joshua. We will worship the Lord. Right? And for those of us who know the story, we know that's not going to last very long. Right? Just read the next book of the Bible, Judges, and how things just go downhill so quickly. So at, at this time, God's people, they were living under the old covenant where God promised his people that he was going to lead them out of Egypt, out of slavery. He was going to bring them into a land that was abundant and fruitful. And in, in, in this covenant, God's people then were to be faithful to God in this old covenant. And so in verse 16, the Israelites gave a thumbs up, basically, to Joshua and said, yep, we're going to keep our side of the bargain. We're going to be faithful to the Lord. But Joshua, he just stops them in their tracks and says, no, you're not. You're not going to be faithful to God. You're not going to worship him. Because Joshua already knows the people's hearts. They can't be trusted. They're depending on their own strength to be faithful to the Lord and said upon depending on the Lord. They should have cried out, we don't have the ability. We need the Lord to give us an ability to be faithful to him. And it didn't last that long. After Joshua and the leaders died, the Israelites fell into idolatry and they became enslaved again. You can read all about that in the book of Judges. So for us, we're not living under this covenant. We're not under the old covenant. We're in the new covenant instituted by Jesus. But this history lesson teaches us that we're to be dependent on the Lord to follow him. We don't have the ability to fear God as he calls us to, to worship God, to flee from idols. We need the Holy Spirit who is working powerfully in us. It's a reminder that we are truly dependent on God, just like the air that we breathe, right? God is holding our lives up. The Bible says that Jesus holds all things together by his powerful word. In other words, right, there's so much in our lives that we don't see that God is, is holding together in our lives, that if God were just to step back, it would all fall apart. Like when I was working uh, in preschool um, as a college job, I was working at a preschool, near UH, and uh, one of the things we would do during the playground time was we would help them do the monkey bars, and they would just do the monkey bars across. And these kids were like three years old, so th there's no way they can do it. There's maybe like one kid that, 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 could, that could try to do it at four years old, but most of the kids, they, they, they can't do it. So we'd hold them up, they would grab onto the monkey bars, we'd carry them on it, and as they go across, right, you would, I'd, you'd hold them, and, and they would do the monkey bars across. And then after a while, one of the kids would say, 
Mr. John, I can do it. I can do it on my own. In my mind, like, no way, you're not going to do it. And so I said, all right. So I, I hold them up on the monkey bar. I let go of my hands, and they're just struggling. Their face is getting all red. And, and, and they're like, help, help. And then I go in, and I, and I help them. And, and, and the point is that they thought they could do it on their own. But I was carrying them the whole time. Just because they couldn't see me, because I was behind them when I was carrying them, right, doesn't mean that they didn't need my help. It was only when I stepped back that they realized, oh, I can't do this. And there are times where God in his gracious patience with us, where he, he just, he's with us, he steps a little back, right, and lets us struggle and show us, no, you can't really do it on your own. You know, you're trying, you're, be, you're trying to be super ambitious, you're even trying to do it for me, but you have to do it through me, by me, not just for me. And so often, right, we can think about doing something for God, and that's good, right? That, that, that's a good intention, but we also have to do it by the power. We need to be dependent upon the Lord in our lives. And that's often reflected in, in prayer, in prayer that reflects our dependency upon him. The people in Joshua's time, they tried on their own, and it didn't last long, and they ended up falling into idolatry because Joshua died and the leaders died. See, the people, just like us, they needed another Joshua in their lives, another Joshua who wouldn't leave them, who wouldn't die, Right? And we know this to be Jesus. Right? Jesus didn't lead us into the physical land of Canaan, but he led us into the heart of the Father through his death on the cross. Through his resurrection from the dead, he gives us a new life of dependency upon the Lord to enjoy him, to fear him, to worship him. And as we think about that in, in this Easter season, as we come upon celebrating the resurrection of, of Jesus next week, Right? What an opportunity that we have to share with others, to invite others to hear about this good news that we are not alone, that we don't have to live life in our own strength, but that we have a God that is a superior treasure than anything else in our lives and that we can really know him personally and enjoy him as our heavenly father. And one of the ways we celebrate that is through taking communion. And so we're going to do that right now together as a church family. So I'm going to encourage you, if you've got your communion cup, to go ahead and pull it out. If you need one, you can grab one at the back table as we celebrate Jesus in our lives, that he gave up his life on the cross, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of sins. Every time, like Abraham, we worship other things, that we treasured other things more than God. Every time that we depended upon ourselves or something else rather than the Lord. Jesus died on the cross for that sin. Every time we didn't fear God rightly, maybe we had a wrong view of him, right? Jesus died on the cross for our sins. So let's drink of the juice representing his blood. Remind ourselves of the forgiveness he gives us. Jesus, who is our greater Joshua, he died on the cross. His body was broken for us. He defeated sin, Satan, and death through his own death on the cross. And so we thank him for that through eating of the cracker. Let's go ahead and do that together. Another way we worship the Lord is through financial giving. You can do that online or in the box in the back. Well, let's go ahead and stand. Let's stand as we respond to the faithfulness of God through singing to him.